This weekend, Virginia International Raceway and the Sports Car Club of America combined to form a mecca for lovers of sports car racing. Almost 500 drivers and over 20 classes will do battle in a race for the gold. Since 1964, SCCA has been crowning national champions at its annual runoffs, the peak of the Summit Racing Equipment SCCA Road Racing Program. For the second straight year, welcome to the track that Paul Newman once called Heaven on Earth for the historic 60th annual SCCA runoff. Hi everybody, welcome. I'm Greg Creamer, joined by Tom O'Gorman, Hayward Wagner. Hayward Wagner will be covering all the action down in the pits and paddock for us. Great to have you here at this legendary venue. It is a spectacular place, a little cloudier than we anticipated this morning. Even a little bit of mist in the air, that's supposed to clear up, and it should be an absolutely fabulous day, and in fact, weekend for our Haggerty Race Days here at the runoffs. Great to have all of you tuning in and watching. Great to have all of you here at the track listening in as well. Great opportunity here to say a huge thank you right from the off to all of the SECA members who are mostly volunteers here serving in so many different facilities and specialties. Our first race today is our American Sedan National Championship. For that, let's get down and hear from Hayward Wagner. Hi, bud. Guys, it's a small but mighty field here in American Sedan, but no shortage of storylines. On the pole, Daniel Richardson. When we first conceived of American Sedan and SCCA, we were coming out of the SSGT era. This third gen Camaro is kind of what started American Sedan. It's been over 25 years, though, since a third gen Camaro has been on the pole here at the runoffs. He is so excited to put that car on pole. The next ever era of American Sedan was really kind of around the S197 Mustang, which Greg Eaton has on the outside row. And what's happened now in the class is Cart Kramlin has shown up with this behemoth, uh, the Dodge product. What I want you guys to take a look at real quick, look at the size of the wheel and tire and brake package on Greg's car. It's exactly the same as the one on the Richardson car. Now look at the one that Clark's got here. This car, your story right here is you've got two cars out front that want to run away and hide and you've got a car that's got a lot of brake and a lot of tire and likes a really long run. And if Clark gets that long run, keep an eye on the Dodge. All right, thank you for that great insight, Hayward. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, yeah, Clark has commented before, it takes a little while for that car to get the tires uh, to come in, but once it does, he is quick. No question about that. As I said, joined by Tom O'Gorman. Uh, Tom, o, your five-time solo national champion, a two-time Pirelli World Challenge champion. Um, you know, this class to me is the closest thing to what the original golden era of Trans Am was like. Highly modified production streetcars, and it is fun. Yeah. Good morning, Greg. And and they are highly modified, and they are uh, they are pushing the limits of some aspects of these cars. But in a lot of ways, they are still drivers' cars. Uh, a lot of them not running any lock brakes. Definitely no traction control anywhere to be seen. And if they could take bigger wheels and tires, they all would. Uh, <laughs> they're kind of limited in certain ways, so that makes them very very challenging in the corners. It makes them really really fast in the straight line, uh, and it also makes for incredible racing. And we heard Hayward talk about that this is a field that is is pretty deep. And you were talking about that as well. Yeah, we have 11 cars qualified uh, for the for the uh, for the starting grid here. But I would say at least the top five, six, even seven drivers all have a chance to win this race. We have a, a lot of storylines from the past of of attrition, of car management, uh, of just drama in general. Uh, these guys aren't afraid to 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 rub fenders and, and get a little circle tracky on them on each other if if they need to every once in a while. Hopefully that never comes to. Uh, fruition but but still this is going to be an incredible uh, incredible race let's take a look at our Mazda track map and really this place presents as almost three different circuits and it kind of clicks into the sectors yeah it's it's three very distinct sectors here so starting from the green flag down into turn one kind of a almost hairpin corner up into NASCAR turn three we call it NASCAR into the left hook at 4a and into the lower S's 4a through 6 would consider the lower S's and this is kind of the handling sector of the track before we get into the high-speed 
balanced sector of the track. These uphill S's, the iconic S's that everybody knows VIR for right there in the background through 789 into South Bend at 10. But the critical exit at Oak Tree, formerly with the Oak Tree at the apex at turn 12, puts you onto that long back straight. Now we're into the dyno pole, all the <laughs> way down that huge back straight. And if you notice, a lot of the front straight is in sector three here. So this is where you want motor, but it's also really defined by your exit at turn 12 and your exits at turn 17, obviously with 14 being that roller coaster down towards hog pen. You know, and everybody thinks about this track that Madison Avenue, what they call the back straight, is is so long. But that run from hog pen to one is almost as long, and you, and you tend to forget about that sometimes, don't you? Uh, which makes it critical. You know, you talked about how important turn 12 was. To me, the most diabolical turn on this track, though, is turn 10. Yeah, South Bend is, is where you've got to get brave. <laughs> and it's always about turning in earlier than you think and kind of backing things down and being under control early, earlier than you think. The harder you try in South Bend, the slower you usually go. Yeah, I call it a commitment meter because if you're not on that exit curb, you're not going fast enough, but one misstep and you're off for a massive slide out there as well. As you can see, field is out on the parade lap. Let's take you through the starting lineup. Starting in the 11th spot, the number three of Kelly Lubosch out of Stanford, Connecticut and uh, New England region in the Chevy Camaro. Starting in the 10th spot, the number 11 of Sam Daniels, a rookie here in a Chevy Camaro. Starting in the 9th spot, making her third runoff start, the 58 of Beth Aquilani out of Collingswood, New Jersey, Philadelphia region in a Pontiac Firebird. Starting in the 8th spot, the number 5 of Kyle Jones, another rookie out of Milford, Michigan, running Detroit region. Uh, driving the engines by J.B. Dunn's welding Pontiac Firebird starting in the seventh spot, making his 11th, or her, I should say, 11th runoff start. The number 51 is Amy Aquilani out of Phoenixville, uh, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia region in the TAR, DBA, Rotors, and Hoosier Hawk Pontiac Firebird. Starting in the sixth spot, uh, the number 56 of Thomas West finished fourth here last year out of Standish, Maine in the New England region. Lime Rock Machine Cadillac starting in the fifth spot. The number 24, eight-time national champion, Andrew McDermott out of Howell, Michigan for Detroit region, the WeatherTech Felice Engines Ford Mustang. Then moving to the fourth spot, starting in his fifth runoff, James Jost in the number 14. Uh, that is the Jost Ironworks Ford Mustang out of New Ringle, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia region. Starting in the third spot, the number uh, 78, making his ninth runoff start. Second last year, Clark Cameron out of DeWitt, Michigan, in the Western Michigan region. Wesley Motorsports, Bill Steen, and Dodge Challenger. And your front row on the outside, starting in that second spot, the number 21, three-time gold medalist Gregory Eaton, and the defending champion out of Woodbridge, Virginia, Washington, D.C. region, in the Eaton Racing and Development Ford Mustang. And as Hayward talked about, on the pole in his 14th runoffs, the number 22 of Daniel Richardson out of Durwood, Maryland, the Washington, D.C. region, the Hoosier Auto Gear Gentium Tech Chevrolet Camaro. And again, 15 laps or 40 minutes, whichever happens to come first. There is a look at Clark Cameron with those big meats on that big car. Uh, and as we said, it takes a little while for them to come up to Tim. But as you said, the front of this field is absolutely stacked. And they're really close together by qualifying. Less than two seconds uh, across the front two rows. But then you have fifth place, eight-time champion, Andy McDermott. He's not necessarily the fastest car, but you know he's got the experience. And, and again, these cars are very difficult to drive, very, very challenging with the equipment management. So it's not all about raw pace. No, and the other thing is, as I said, we had some mist in the air this morning, so these opening laps could be a little bit sketchy. All right, and uh, perhaps as a result, no, the pace car is in. Leading him to the green will be the 22 of Daniel Richardson, defending champ George Eaton, or Gregory Eaton on the outside. Wait for it, we are looking for this one. We're green, and a huge start by James Jost. If he got that right, an absolute leap into the lead in the Cadillac coming up right with him in the hands of Thomas West. But look at that deep move to the inside. Richardson and Eaton able to hold sway. Yost slots into third. Eaton uh, trying to do the roundup. That's going to give him the inside into turn three. Tom, what a start by this front row. And Eaton, a local here, he knows this track better than a lot of the drivers. They're still side by side through turn three, out all the way on the curb, rubbing those fenders like we oh! mentioned, but they keep it mostly clean into left. <laughs> Unfortunately, Jost had that monster start and just kind of looks like he's struggling with the handling on that car as soon as he hit the brake pedal in turn one and continuing to drop back. Yeah, he's under huge pressure now, and Cameron 
actually gave up that spot to James Jost. And the Cadillac came through on him as well in the hands of Thomas West on board with Hammer now. And yeah, it looks like a definite problem for Yost. Just, oh, and it looks like he has just, is, did he just let go? No, it's under right-hand corners. That car's smoking heavily, and he's been struggling with, it looks like an engine issue completely oh. through the exhaust pipe, and he's going to pull off. It's still in pace. He's trying, but I don't think it's going to make it very much further. Yeah, and of course, Cameron, huge urgency to get around here, and now Yost understands that there's a big problem trying to get out of the way, and the question is, is he putting fluid down on the track? Doesn't look like it. I think uh, Camburn would have been in trouble if he yeah. was. So I, I think he's mostly clear into the south paddock there. Uh, a great place to disappear. But a great start now for the Cadillac out of sixth position, Thomas West. Uh, kind of a nightmare start for Clark Camburn here as we take a look at that, that big challenger. Uh, he's got a long way to make up. It's going to be at the front, though. Uh, Greg Eaton takes the lead early. Yeah, and uh, yeah, for Camburn, obviously getting hung up behind Yost, and I'm sure a little concerned. And you know, the thing is, uh, it's not just slippery on the tires; it's visibility. If it is, uh, you know, puking out a little bit of fluid, boy, a wide run down through Hogpen, but uh, Eaton doing a beautiful job getting around Richardson and grabbing that lead, and they have already opened up a pretty significant margin back to, as you said, the fast-starting Cadillac of West. So right here into the climbing S's, you see as soon as he turns to the right, looks like uh, the heavy smoke begins. A couple more uh, right-hand turns, and then this is the view from right behind our camera car is Clark Cambert. Uh, you're basically just following blind, hoping this car is staying at pace. Decent visibility, but really, really sketchy. And look at how far away those leaders look to be already for Cambert, and that's just hard. Yeah, and it, it looked like there was a little something on his windscreen, but not enough to uh, maybe affect him here. But look at this. Uh, once again, Daniel Richardson has glommed right back on after losing a little bit after getting passed. He's right there now uh, in the uh, tracks of Greg Eaton. So Eaton, your defending champion, Danny Richardson had a mechanical issue early in last year's weather-affected race. He, did a D he actually scored a DNF last year, the 22 car on pole, definitely wants redemption. Anything better, making it to the checkered is going to feel better than last year's race. Uh, but, I mean, you want the gold medal, of course. Well, last year's race was an absolute crapshoot, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, the weather was just atrocious the, uh, on the entire event. Camber now starting to look like he's finding a little bit of pace and starting to close in a little bit on Thomas West. Here's that key run out of what they still call Oak Tree Turn. He missed that beautiful old Oak Tree and uh, came down in a hurricane a few years ago. But now let's see what Cameron can do. But as you said, look it up the road. Pretty sizable margin from Richardson. Almost four and a half seconds back to West and then Cameron. So Cameron qualified about two seconds a lot faster than Thomas West. So it was a great start for the Cadillac driver. Uh, but we do expect Cameron to be the faster of the two cars. The question is how long it takes Cameron to get by the Cadillac. As the, the Challenger is, believe it or not, one of the better handling cars. Not necessarily special down the straightaways in any particular way, which means he's just got to find his way by in the corners. Well, Clark is a three-time medalist at the run-ups, but only one in this current era. Um, he uh, has a couple of medals back in his days when he was running in Formula Ford and was an absolute gun in that category. He's looking for it here, Tomo. Down to the inside, gonna go deep on the brakes and let's see, does West give him the spot or try and go around? West concedes, tucks in behind, and now we'll see what Clark can do in an effort to try and run down the guys up front. That last lap, uh, you pointed out how much quicker he was running than West. Problem is now, that last lap was about the same as Eaton and Richardson. But now we'll see if Clark can dig a little deeper. All Clark wants right now is for Danny Richardson to get racy. He wants <laughs> these two to start to go side by side, make this quicker, because he's essentially just got to put in qualifying laps. You see the gap between the top two and third and fourth place cars. But as we said, that Richardson takes oh. a look up the inside. Boy, and I'll tell you, oh, and a, that looks like a motor problem as well for Eaton. And that's and definitely he's putting fluid. oil down. Yep, the back end coming around on him. And he's off in the grass, but suddenly this piece of track is going to be really treacherous. And that time, Camber definitely had no line of sight at all. Super conservative uh, coming up through the uphill S's. Doesn't look to have affected any other cars in the field, but both of our S197 Mustang drivers with engine issues this morning. Uh, and that's really unfortunate to see as the defending champion will certainly not defend his win. Now the question is whether we'll stay green for that car sitting off to the right at the top of the uphill S's.
Yeah, it's going to be interesting. And for Cameron, he must be going, well, I just can't get behind somebody because they're going to blow up. And uh, drop it, oh, and a big spin here from the number three, Kelly Lubosch, out of Stanford, Connecticut. And uh, my guess is you can see that plume of smoke still in the air. He caught some of that liquid. That is the uphill S's for sure. Everybody knows that that's there except for Danny Richardson. When he comes through this section of track, if it's green the next lap, he has no indication or knowledge, unless he saw that in his mirror, that that section of track is going to be uh, affected by fluid. So now, I mean, it's never been more important for one, those corner workers out there, and SCCA's got the best to be throwing that surface flag like crazy and really critical for Daniel Richardson to be spotting those flag stations Otherwise, it could be uh, pretty bad news for him. And the surface flag, of course, is the red and white, uh, red and yellow striped flag. The question as a driver, of course, is always, well, how serious are they? <laughs> what, what does that actually mean? You know, is it, is it the entire track covered in oil or is it a piece of dirt sitting at the apex? So he's going to have to make that risk reward assess assessment. And he's luckily in a position where he's got plenty of gap. He can be very conservative and not lose a lot of time as we continue to be green as Danny Richardson leading American Sedan. Well, if you've got, if you're an experienced worker and an experienced driver, uh, and I do a lot of flagging, it's the more vigorous a flag is displayed, that's your clue from a driver's perspective. If it's just out there, you know, it's like, all right, be a little careful here. If it's, and you can see that flag off there, if it's being displayed, yeah, you can see Richardson right there caught that first bit of oil. And now he's through that zone and there a dejected three-time medalist who looked like he had the pace to maybe be going for a fourth one here, but that leaves Daniel Richardson nine seconds up the road on Camber. And Camber, after getting caught again behind Eaton and that time in all that oil, uh, he's just lost so much ground. And this is an issue. We have Ooh. cars starting to push the limits in that section of track, and it's a very long and slow ride for Kyle Jones, the number five Pontiac Firebird. Uh, so that's at least three cars that have been caught out by this incident, including the car that sort of started it all there, that the sad 21 car of uh, your defending champion, Greggy. And I'll tell you what, Andy McDermott, who's an eight-time champion, never even completed of the lap, he may not have even made it out onto the track, so this has uh, been a real challenge for the Mustangs here. Yeah, that's a great point. We, we talked about him, and then the race got exciting. We didn't even notice he wasn't really in the fight with those first couple laps. Uh, all of our Mustangs falling short this year. Uh, let's take a look at the 58 of Beth Aquilani running now in the sixth position, having moved up, uh, mostly due to attrition, uh, from uh, a little further back. Yeah, Beth doing a nice job, and now that she's gone around Jones, uh, who had that spin, she's up into the top five. So a great run for Beth in her third runoffs. And uh, of course, she's part of that uh, big Aquilani gang uh, that come out here. And uh, uh, Sister Amy up in the uh, four spot right now, the number 51, uh, her 11th runoff. And uh, looking at pace here, she's uh, just a little off of what Thomas West is doing. So we'll see what she's going to be able to do. But Beth cracking the top five. She's going to be delighted with that. But speaking of the of the gap, uh, just ahead of this driver that we're looking at on camera is the 51 of Amy Aquilante. Yeah. Coming back from a big accident uh, a couple years back at VIR, medaled at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Uh, she's turning the exact same lap times as Tom West. That car, as we see now on camera, could absolutely be in the fight for a podium, uh, a podium spot if she can find just a little more pace. That is the, the distance, the blue Cadillac rear end just up the road. <laughs> a little bit of a handful <laughs> on the Firebirds uh, curbs there. Uh, I mean, she's going to want that medal. Yeah, you just, and, and I mean, you know, you just have to attack. That's what the runoffs are all about. It's 15 laps, winner take the gold in the national championship. But it still means a lot to have the silver or the bronze draped around your neck at the end of the race. So everybody is going for these uh, top three positions. Uh, Amy has a second. She's got a silver medal in her kit. Uh, and Beth, if she hangs on to this top five, would be her best ever finish in uh, the, the runoff she's run. So the Aquilani clan doing a nice job as Richardson now absolutely flying, puts Kelly Lubosch uh, down a lap here as uh, we are now working uh, lap number four. He is absolutely flying, but he's yeah. not the fastest car on track. That goes to Clark Camper in the Challenger at the back of shot, just coming down the roller coaster as you see him flick by. He's been about a second a lap faster every single lap. The gap at the line last time through, seven seconds, call it 6.8 seconds. Uh, if he's a second faster for the rest of the race, he gets there. 
but can he actually get through? That's the thing, is the old adage is catching and passing two different things. And yeah, it wasn't that long ago I just had mentioned that Clark was nine seconds adrift, and now uh, it's uh, just over six. Here he comes, working his way around on Lubash and heading into this really, really tricky turn number one here. Uh, really a fascinating corner, isn't it? It is. You, you can't really tell until you drive it, but it's actually a little bit downhill into the braking zone, then a little bit uphill into the turn-in. Then it's this increasing radius corner, but it's always a little slower than you want it to be. Uh, it's a very, very difficult corner, and it's critical to the lap because it does put you through up a, a, a decent straightaway into a pretty fast corner at turn three. Then you have to navigate these lower S's, and, and one of the things we've talked about, obviously, it's a bigger car, it's on bigger wheels, bigger tires, da-da-da. It is a 3,600-pound minimum weight allowed for the Challenger. Most of the other cars, somewhere between 32 and 3,300. The biggest problem for Clark is he can't get it there. It's actually a, closer to 3,900 pounds, so it's 300 pounds <laughs> over the weight that he's allowed to do. Well, look how sketchy those uphill S's still look to be. Yep. Uh, so that's it, it, it's a big car, but it's it's bigger than it's supposed to be <laughs> by SCCA rules right now. Right. Ooh, wiggle there for the Cadillac, obviously, as uh, we we'll continue to watch this for Thomas West. And I'm noticing, I think Lubosch has a little bit, I've been watching the left front corner uh, he might be having a little bit of smoke. That might be more just brake related, uh, the way that it was appearing. We'll keep an eye on that as we have a good look here at Thomas West working hard for that uh, bronze medal right now. The gap that he has uh, is uh, some six seconds right now to Amy Aquilani, but Aquilani just is flying out there, just ran a lap over half a second quicker, and her, then her most recent lap uh, almost over a second quicker, so Amy's coming. Yeah, the gap right now, about six seconds between this Cadillac that we're taking a look at, the 56 of Thomas West, and the 51 Pontiac Firebird of Amy Aquilante. Uh, they're not going to be in the same uh, straightaway or sequence of corners just yet, but they're getting there. You'll see the blue car flash by just there up the hill. And on that last lap, Richardson got through the traffic a little bit cleaner. Clark got held up a bit in that margin. Now back up to seven and a half seconds. Uh, and it might also be, obviously, there's communication to Richardson. And uh, they probably told him, hey, you know, Cameron's starting to close up a little bit. And uh, so he may have just dropped the hammer, too. So uh, Richardson, uh, you know, on pole, really flying in that Hoosier Auto Gear Gentium Tech Camaro. And how cool would it be to see a car of this vintage, um, you know, get back out front? And that's one of the great things about American Sedan. And look at him throw that around is, uh, you know, you can run a car of older vintage. And if it's set up right and you drive it well, you can still do this. That's what we were talking about, it being a driver's class. And a lot of the, the rules for this class are written around keeping cars relevant that are, uh, again, in the spirit of what the class was originally meant to be. Taking those lap times, uh, a, a quick catch up from the top two, actually Richardson quicker the last two times through. And we ha we still have those tricky conditions in the uphill S's, but the lap times are back towards where they have been uh, fastest through the race. So I think the drivers are either getting confident or the conditions are cleaning up just slightly there through the S's. Look here, it's Sam Daniels, a rookie here out of Texas in his Chevrolet Camaro and uh, started in the 10th spot and with some of the attrition is up into seventh. And, uh, you know, when you come to your first runoffs, uh, you know, especially in a, in a class like this, uh, it's such a learning experience, isn't it? Uh, you know, okay, you know, where do I stack up against some of the other competitors? You know, is it, you know, me? Is it the car? What do I need to do? Uh, but boy, you're just drinking from the fire hose. Yeah, and Sam Daniels scored the most points in the uh, Hoosier Super Tour this season. So he actually came in the points leader uh, didn't come in as the fastest driver after uh, the first day of qualifying, of course, but just to, to do your first runoffs. Uh, a lot of these drivers, I, I'll, I'll always remember the first race I did with spectators. How how different that made the whole thing feel. Yep. Uh, and this is a this is a big spectator event. You look at the you look at the hillside there through the lower S's. There's a bunch of people watching you race. Uh, this is going to be on TV, and, and, and you can watch it back on YouTube. That's a huge uh, a huge effect on their mental game for the race. You're going to want to do the best you can. Uh, as we see big sparks from the brakes, I think on the right front of that. Meryl, it just makes everything more exciting. It does, it does. And on, on your uh, on your pace lap, uh, you're seeing it, and it either it totally intimidates you or it, it makes you go, all right, showtime. And that's what we're doing right now, about halfway through the run for the gold here at VIR in American Sedan. A car like this 
shouldn't exist. Something this big, this luxurious, shouldn't move like a Mazda. And yet, it does. Oh my God, it sounds epic as well. This car is an SUV with bragging rights. The all new three row Mazda CX-90. Okay, so pretend this is your race car. It's on the trailer, on the way home after a day at the track. And say you have an accident. Ouch. But at least your truck's insurance will pay for another one? Yeah, not so fast. Your standard insurance probably won't pay to replace your car. That's true whether it's in the trailer, in the paddock, in the garage, or in the repair shop. If you want to be covered for the whole value of your race car, you need guaranteed value coverage from Haggerty. We agree on an accurate value up front, and in the event of a covered total loss, anywhere off the track, we pay that amount. You'll be protected in storage, in transit, in the paddock, or a repair shop against collision, fire, theft, no matter what or where you race. All for less per year than you spend on a set of racing tires. Haggerty, let's drive together. Welcome back, everybody, to our Haggerty Race Days and our broadcast presented by Mazda. Your tire rack pole sitter, Daniel Richardson, continues to lead, but while we were in break, uh, I don't know whether he got held up in traffic or whether Clark Camber just found something, but Clark ran a lap 1.2 seconds quicker and has now trimmed that margin to just a tick over six seconds. I'd speculate it was an issue for Richardson somewhere along the lap as he ran uh, almost a second and a half slower than his standard pace had been running a 206, whereas Camber uh, and, and Richardson's previous fast laps in general have been in the 204s. There is the gap now, and we also have a great battle brewing for the bronze medal. Thomas West, Amy Aquilani getting closer. We'll take a look at that if they start to get racy. Yeah, that is closing up very much so. And uh, Camber, uh, you know, we've been talking about, you know, it's Wesley Motorsports, Bill Steen, and that uh, he gets some support from Dodge, too. Uh, but he's got a, a new company called Camber Performance as well. So that's all part of the program here as uh, you know, he's sort of the lone warrior in this Dodge Challenger. Uh, he and that Wesley Motorsports team uh, doing all the development on this car. Yeah, and it's... it's an interesting dynamic right in American sedan. You have the older car uh, leading the race. It's it's 30 some years old, which means it's got that much development into it. You can make up that good over time. There's a, not a lot of Dodge Challengers racing. Most of them are going to be in the Trans Am series, which are not really Dodge Challengers anyway. So Clark Hambert's having to do this entire development on this chassis by itself uh, and, and have to learn a lot of things. I talked to him about even just something simple like the shock valve. They tried to replicate kind of what the stock car would have, and it was not good over bumps. They did an entire revalve of the shocks. Now it's a lot better over bumps. Those are the types of race car development things that both, both an experienced driver and an engineer like Clark Cameron uh, can do, but yep. has to take time to do. And also that Cameron performance is also a customer racing prep shop. He's got, um, I believe it's an Alfa a Romeo, a, a Giulietta that, uh, a Genetta, excuse me, that, uh, sorry about that, a Genetta that uh, they are fielding for customers as well. So uh, really trying to expand the racing program uh, for uh, Clark Camber on a lot of different levels here. And on that lap, Richardson, I think you were spot on because that lap, he's right back down into that high 204 range where he's been uh, you know, consistently running at this stage. Yeah, both drivers now turning almost the, the same lap time last time through, but this is that battle for third place. Aquilani has caught Thomas West. West in the Cadillac, Amy Aquilani in the uh, 51 Firebird, and it looks like she's got a good run coming into turn one. Down the inside, deep on the brakes, they're going to be side by side through to the apex. Oh. <laughs> Beautiful run, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, that's that that runoff of hog pen is just so so important, and maybe a little bit more motor in the Firebird as well helps. Uh, as you can see, a little bit less arrow uh, bolted onto the Firebird, but uh, it's not going to be uh, as as limited by the you know the air at 130, 140 miles an hour. Yeah, absolutely. And you know we talk about tricky corners. Hog pen certainly fits the bill. I mean, you know it's downhill, and again you've got to be absolutely on the edge to really get that run through there. But kind of like. Uh, up in uh, in South Bend, one misstep and you're off in the grass, and that's a downhill slide in the grass. So uh, it's a it's a little spooky down there. Yeah, it's a huge risk reward. We saw Greg Eaton actually drop those left side tires coming out on I think believe lap two or even lap one. Uh, as you mentioned, it's downhill. It's also pretty wet out there right now. It's really tough. Just in general, everywhere at VIR, if you drop a tire, you're usually going for a pretty long ride. 
Yeah, this is a, you know, I've often said this is a beautiful road course. You almost have to drive like a street course with that level precision because there's very little actual paved runoff or gravel. If you go off, you're in grass, and especially if it's a little moist, you just slide forever, and a lot of it slopes downhill. So you have a tendency to still hit things. Right? One of those classic American road racing circuits. Uh, that a lot of them have, have been updated to be what we would say is a little more safe, but uh, in the way that they just pave things at gravel traps, VAR uh, is still the way it would have been driven very similarly back in the 50s and si or 60s and 70s. Uh, there was a really cool shot coming through Oak Tree of Amy Akulani saw it at the wheel, up on the wheel, driving this Firebird. Uh, again, these cars are, they're, they're cool and they're highly modified, but they're also, you, you gotta wheel them. Oh yeah, uh, and you know, the thing is with the weight and the power, you know, the tires tend to go off. And uh, so at that point, car control is everything. And you know, if you can just sort of carry the speed through there, that's a biggie. And uh, Amy was our Sunoco 260 winner on Tuesday at Sunoco 260 Tuesday. And it's an interesting award from Sunoco that if you turn a lap, the closest lap turned to point two six zero at the end of it. And she got the closest with her lap in that. And uh, absolutely great job uh, right up near the sharp end of things at a 206, 211. That's about as good as it gets. And uh, it was a large chunk of some fuel from the folks at Sunoco. Look at this duel here. Uh, it's the number five, Kyle Jones, and uh, that number 11, uh, or the number three of Kelly Lubosch. Uh, they're having a, an interesting little battle. And the number 11 of Sam Daniels in the mix as well here. So uh, back in the order a little bit, but doesn't mean they're not racing fiercely. Yeah, the yellow number three is uh, is getting put a lap down That's in that true. exchange. Yeah. So, But it's still never ideal to have to pass somebody through the roller coaster. That's just a really, really, uh, it, it might as well be a one lane track at that point. But yeah. the actual <laughs> battle we're taking the look at is the 58 car, the blue Firebird of Beth Aquilani and the comeback drive from the number five, the purple and white Firebird of Kyle Jones. Jones was one of the drivers that went for the big slide up the uphill S's in the oil from Greg Eaton. So now you can see a little bit of damage to the front splitter on that car uh, and, and a comeback drive for the number five. He's got a couple more laps to try to pick up one more position to get himself back into the top five. And Kyle had qualified in the eight spot, so he's doing really, really well, especially coming back from that off. And uh, Beth, obviously, is going to be fighting like crazy because if she hangs on to fifth, it'll be her best runoffs performance ever as we now are into our final third of this race. Ten laps down, five to go, and watching Beth Aquilani wheel it up through those S's. And I see that everybody has sort of figured the line that first turn in to those S's. Uh, everybody's staying about uh, three, four feet off of the apex curb, which is probably uh, keeps those left side tires off of that oil. It's almost like a rain line, really, because yeah. <laughs> you have to avoid the slippery stuff. But, you know, the key to the uphill S's, especially for cars with as much power and as little grip as these tend to have, uh, is, is finding that float. You have to find the way that the terrain catches you. It starts to go uphill right as you turn to the right for that second flick of the uphill S's. Now we're going to take the grip away, the third one. you got to figure out the float even further. Uh, and you can see that that uh, the purple and white Firebird of uh, Kyle Jones had a huge float coming through the second and third transitions there. Really cool. Yeah, it did. Absolutely. Daniel Richardson, there he is, continuing to lead that margin. Just staying right around seven seconds here. And he was able to get through on that lap car. Now uh, Clark Cameron is coming up on the back. And uh, you just hope you catch these cars uh, in a spot where you can just drive by them. And uh, they're very good, and those workers are going to be throwing those flags like crazy. And uh, Clark is actually going to catch this car in the absolutely perfect spot. And he just moves way out of the way for Clark as well. Well, it would have been perfect, but it looks like he accidentally kind of ran a little <laughs> bit wide. Camburn had to check up on the entry to the corner and, and tighten up his exit because <laughs> the number 11 of Sam Daniels was going a little agricultural. But uh, through he goes. And the biggest problem for Camburn and the success for Richardson is they've just continued to run the same lap times back and forth, exchanging tents back and forth between these two cars, uh, which means the gap has stayed the same and they're just running out of laps. Uh, well, Cameron's running out of laps to do anything about it. Danny Richardson's running out of laps to be stressed about this race. Boy, and Amy Aquilani there, who was our Hawk Performance Breakthrough winner, and that uh, is a Wednesday qualifying program for the uh, driver that advances the most 
from Tuesday to Wednesday, and uh, she did a great job there. And uh, you know, obviously, uh, put her well up onto the uh, starting order here, and she's fighting her way through, doing an even better job now, sitting in this third spot. Uh, but boy, I'll tell you, she got on the hammer early coming out of Oak Tree, and uh, almost had to check up for a second to get uh, that car to stop from pushing wide as well. And it's just a, a you know fact this late in the race, these cars, these tires are feeling it. You can see a little bit cautious coming into the out of roller coaster into hog pen. You see the car just a little bit less dramatic than normal because it probably doesn't have much more in it left at this point uh, with those tires being so hot uh, and abused at this point of the race. But in a bronze medal position, another medalist uh, uh, opportunity, excuse me, for Amy Aquilani here. Taking a look back, this is going to be the gap between our top two. They are coming through the lower S's into the upper S's, uh, and this time Clark Camber did take a little bit more out of it as Richardson is really dealing with some handling uh, excitement, we'll call it, in that old Camaro, really having a hard time keeping the car precise at the top of the upper, upper S's. It seems to be floating, doesn't it? It just, uh, just, you know, the back end just rotating around. He's driving the wheels off it, and here comes Cambern. And uh, we'll see what Clark is able to do here in these final four laps. And uh, going for the championship. And uh, Richardson, uh, it's really great for him. His highest finish ever in the runoffs was third in 2018 in Sonoma. So obviously, uh, this would be absolutely fantastic for him to be able to hang on to it, to hop on board with. Clark Camber, this long run down Madison Avenue. See them with the speed they carry here, dipping into the brakes early, turning in. And this is a really tricky entry into the roller coaster. Isn't it? Yeah, it sounded like he had to do kind of a, a double clutch downshift or something. On the brakes hard, gets the downshift done, but had to come off the brakes to restabilize the car. Uh, maybe a little bit of handling challenges for the Challenger. No pun intended. Also, well, uh, also happening for Cambridge as you see just how much sawing at the wheel, the car moving around. That's due to the lack of aero. He just doesn't have a lot of uh, of, the, of the air flowing over the car, helping him uh, as all of the drivers dealing with that float that we've been mentioning. And that's one of the things I absolutely love about this class is you know I've always and I often catch some flack from it you know for cars that have a lot of aero calling it false grip you know because you're using you know the black arts uh, uh, to generate grip. In a car that's doing it all with mechanical grip, that is really spectacular. As is this comeback drive by Kyle Jones. He is all over the back right now. Beth Aquilani, this is for the final spot in the top five. And he really gave it some welly coming out of Oak Tree. He's in a good spot to be able to pick up a toe. He's been stuck there for a couple yeah. laps, though. He can't quite figure out a way past Beth Aquilani, who's been doing a great job responding to the pressure, picking up the pace just slightly and keeping the number five at bay. Uh, and these two cars, it looks like Aquilani really has some straight line speed. Look at that. Even with the draft, Kyle Jones was not able to pull up to the back until the braking zone. He's in a little deep, and he loses it under braking, has to lock it down not to get into the back of Aquilani, and he's going to kiss the guardrail just slightly. Another ride for the number five. Ah, uh, what a shame because he had such a good charge. And as you said, he just brushed the guardrail. So uh, if, if you get the car going, looks like he just was able to do that. He should be able to continue. But, of course, he's lost all that ground. And uh, kudos to him for just opting to lock it up and throw it away as opposed to hitting Beth. Uh, that was, uh, you know, once he made that little error, that was a class move. Looks like the brakes on that car are just starting to go away, honestly. He broke about the same time as Aquilani, but you could see the car just would not stop, and the brake rotors are glowing yeah. bright orange. Uh, I think, like you said, he just tried to lock it down, but also a little bit of smoke now from the back of the number five. Uh, got more drama than he hoped for in this race. Yeah, and I'm wondering, is that from the back, or is that brake fire, possibly, with the brakes over overheating? Uh, you know, we're just late in the race, and these cars take a pounding. But, boy, in that last lap... Cambern found another half second or, or more than a second. That margin now down to under five seconds at this stage. Problem for Clark is only two laps to go. But there you can see he's definitely closer in the frame. And uh, Richardson catching that, uh, uh, that lap car of Lubosch. Oh, Clark in too hot. Back end comes around. He's going to be able to keep it out of going too deep down there. And if you go really deep down there, not a good place to be. But, uh, oh, he's going to lose all this ground. And uh, he did have a large chunk of time back to Amy Aquilani. So he should be able to uh, hang on to second here. Oh, heartbreaking, though. And, and in fact, they just took the white flag. So this is the final oh, lap this of the is race. The final lap, but we, yeah. were, we were speculating some issues under decel, under braking, <laughs> yeah. for the Challenger. And, and indeed, it looks like the back end just came around. 
uh, under braking, maybe too much rear bias, or it, it almost looked like it was just raining on him for a second, but yeah. he just goes for this strange little ride uh, and, and luckily was able to maintain second, so he didn't change what medal he's going to get at the end if he can just complete this lap, uh, but it, it always just, it just feels horrible to have that happen on the last lap. Absolutely, and you know, when you're uh, trying to go for a gold after you've had three podiums and three medals but never a gold, and to be closing, you know, you never give up hope, right? And then to have that happen can be just gutting. But, man, yeah, that car, he is he is working really hard just keeping that thing on the track right now. We talked about management is a big thing oh, on this okay. entire uh, on this entire class. You have to deal with the equipment going away on you, yep. and, and we're seeing that come, come true for a lot of the drivers, but not this one. Danny Richardson has been rock solid the entire race, has driven the car for what it's got and not too much more, uh, and, and has done a beautiful job. Yeah, and it just showing great car control and, and the like. And he's got to be a little concerned. He's going to be happy to have that lead because right in front of him now is uh, Kyle Jones. And there's a lot of smoke coming out of the back of that car. And Richardson has the room to be able to say, all right, back it off, bring it home. Out of hog pen for the last time, the 2023 American Sedan National Champion, your pole sitter, Daniel Richardson. An absolutely fabulous run. Uh, mistake free gave it one heck of a ride and put it together Clark Cambern is going to come around and pick up his fourth runoffs medal uh, but once again it will be the second place and not that gold but still you can see that car was off just a little bit and uh, had that spin down in turn one did a nice job uh, keeping it together here and then uh, we're going to see Amy Aquilani she should be next through. There she is, all the way from seventh up to the podium on her TAR DBA Rotors Hoosier Hawk. Pontiac Firebird is going to bring it home and claim the final medal, the bronze, here at Virginia International Raceway. And, of course, with uh, the problem for Kyle Jones, uh, here comes Thomas West, who's going to bring it home in the fourth spot. And uh, how about that? Two Aqualanis look like they're going to end up in the top five. Yeah, very well-driven races, and, and a, again, a huge congratulations to Danny Richardson. Been trying for years yeah. and years, and finally gets his first gold medal uh, out of the uh, the Maryland area. Uh, and then this is that last bit. There he is, uh, actually <laughs> keep, keeping up with Kyle Jones, even on his cool-down lap. He wants to get to Hayward to talk about how excited he is, I think. I think that's exactly it, but he's also a little mindful of that smoke coming out, so I think he's trying to uh, just kind of watch what's happening here. And, you know, everybody on a cool-down lap here, but, you know, when you've got that, uh, the first one of the checkers, especially when it means national championship, you just want to soak this lap in, don't you? Yeah, for sure. And he's going to get one more after with a checkered flag in his hand, maybe some family and friends on board to celebrate. <laughs> Kyle Jones, again, having some dramas this race, two big off-track excursions, but is able to keep the car clean and straight and get to the checkered flag uh, in just outside the top five in the number sixth position. Uh, the first car on the lead lap, or last car on the lead lap, I should say, uh, as he's got just enough smoke left in it to bring it home, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, it's going to be Sam Daniels, Kelly Lubash, uh, rounding out the finishers, both a lap down. Yeah. Oh, I, what's that? I think Richardson might have missed the checkered flag and the pit lane. I think he thought he was still racing. Oh, Can boy. Can we see him in the background? Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe I, not. Maybe I saw the wrong, uh, the wrong angle. It looked like he was <laughs> forgot yeah. to pit for a minute. <laughs> well... That, uh, that pit entry, uh, you know, from weird angles can really be a bit deceiving. My concern here is, one, uh, is the number five of Jones uh, putting oil down, and two, is he going to be in, you know, have enough, as you said, to get around uh, to get back into pit lane? But, yeah, Richardson, Camburn, and Amy Aquilani, your podium here, your medalist, uh, and uh, just absolutely fantastic. And here comes Clark Camburn heading down into pit lane as well. And, uh, you know, a medal at the runoffs is a pretty special thing. Uh, and, you know, everybody wants to have that top step of the box medal, but still an absolutely great job. And with that, earning that top step on the box, Hayward, is Daniel Richardson. Daniel's uh, trying to get the helmet, trying to get the uh, Hans or device off, get every the, everything off. This race looked like it went real well until the checkered flag came out, and it's been a struggle to get into pit lane, a struggle to get the gear off. But we're going to get to him here in a second. Ah. Daniel, how's your morning going? It's going pretty good. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't see the checkered flag. I thought I was still in the last lap, and I was, like, not sure whether to come into the pits. 
and I'm screaming on the radio, did I take the checker? There's people waving at me right now. Um, oh my gosh. I, <laughs> it's been five years since we finished one of these, or four years or something. We've always been knocking at the door. <laughs> Finally got it. Been doing this since 2010. And uh, I gotta thank my wife. She's got all three kids at home. And they're awful. <laughs> thank you, wife. Thank you, Elena. I love you. Um, who's your tire? Carbotech brakes. Uh, Dave Jones setting up this car. We worked on setup all week long. He's absolutely incredible. We changed things like you wouldn't believe. Um, my mom, my crew, everybody at home. I'm, who's your tire? Who's your tire? The tires, I beat the, the yeah out of them, and they still are there. And uh, Carbotech brakes, man. The, the pads never, they never wavered. And uh, auto gear transmissions. The transmission was smooth as butter the entire race. I can't thank auto gear enough. We finally did it. <laughs> well, big congratulations to you. Obviously, some other guys stumbled, gave you a little bit of a gap. Talk about the focus you had to maintain through this race. It looked like you just kept the car on a slide rail the entire time. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we were. Jimmy got a huge jump on the start. Uh, I think we went three wide into turn one. I was on the inside. Greg was the meat of the sandwich. Uh, Greg and I stayed side by side. There was a little bit of rubbing going through three and four, but uh, you know it was all clean. Um, I stayed with Greg nose to tail until I think he might have had a problem on the backside and got by him. And then after that, it was just put my head down. And my crew guy Kent was giving me a gaps each lap. And, uh, you know, I'd do a 205 or something here, and then he'd catch up like a second, and then I'd do another 204, and i just trying to maintain the gap. And I'm just sitting there counting the laps and talking to the car, please hold together, please hold together. Well, you and this car are going to take one more lap here at VAR, the victory lap. Congratulations. Thank you. Wow. You could, it, I have to say this. If anybody doesn't think that this means something, listen to that interview. Uh, it was absolute pure emotion after pushing like this for as long as he has and to finally get it done. Uh, you know, this is the pinnacle of SCCA club racing. And when you get a national championship, uh, it, it just means the world. And let's get down to Hayward once again with our second place finisher. Clark, you ended up a little bit on an island on your own in the race. Yep. Kind of looked like you were managing everything, and then turn one, couple of laps to go. What happened there? It was one, it was the last lap. I just got distracted because I knew we weren't going to win, and I kind of missed my brake. Like I I got on the pedal wrong and couldn't heel toe, and just locked the rears when I put it in second. So it was a it was a really good drive until that corner. But you know this car is really a long run car, and I knew if we lost too much time at the start, we were going to be in trouble. And we were, I mean, we, we kind of got caught out by Joe's at the beginning, and then Wes got his elbows out and lost a bit of time there. And then until Eaton blew up, we, I, I knew we could catch those guys. And then when he blew up, I like couldn't see anything in the S's, and I just lost a ton of time. And at that point, I was able to come to bring down the gap a little bit, but just not enough to really push Richardson. So it is what it is, another second. But uh, I, I'm, I'm so thankful to everybody that's helped me, my wife, my family. The guys that stayed with late with me last night, Peter and Mark, um, uh, Wesley Motorsports, Bill Stein, Dampers, Hoosier Tire, just everybody that's helped with this effort. So thankful to be here. Well, congratulations on the podium. I know it's not the one you most wanted, but it's another podium at the runoff. Thank you. And while we're here, we've got Amy Aqualante. Come on up. Another podium. How does this one feel? You know what? This one feels pretty darn good. Uh, a lot better result than last time I was here, so uh, really excited to, to make it to the podium after a tough week of qualifying. So you were not able to run last year, and uh, you have a special member of the pit crew this year, correct? Last year was my maternity leave, so we uh, have a new baby girl, Adeline. Uh, she's just a, just turned a year, so she's at the track with us, and it feels great to be back out here and trying to see if she'll get in the seat soon. <laughs> well, congratulations to you on both the kid and the podium. Thank you very much. Well, that's going to be a nice little bobble for the other uh, of the little one to play with. A nice bronze medal from the runoffs, and uh, you know, for Clark Cambern, uh, you know, a lot of his work with him in uh, different roles he does. And uh, for him, when he had that spin, I'm betting going through his mind, thinking about getting to the win, he was saying to himself, yeah, that's not going to happen. Yeah. And that's unfortunate. But for Daniel Richardson, the emotion, uh, you know, the, the pursuit of the gold here and uh, never quite getting there. And then doubling it up with the Tire Rack Pole Award. 
uh, you can hear it. It, it. Everything came good. And I think because he didn't know if he took the checkered, it took <laughs> that much longer for everything to sink in that he actually won the runoffs after what he said 13 years and DNFing the last couple. It's got to feel like the best redemption ever. Uh, the emotion made me a little emotional, and then that great choke of his uh, wife and kids at home. They've got to be thrilled watching this race live. Oh, absolutely. Let's go back and take a look at some highlights. And there you can see the start. And look there, up on the outside, James Jost got an absolute monster start in the Cadillac of West going with him. But they just kind of got frozen out. But Clark was the one who dropped back uh, into that fourth spot. And then the problem started first for James Jost. Yeah, it just wasn't the Ford's year, but this is that pass back for third place at the time. It became second place very quickly for Clark Camber uh, up at the front. It was Eaton that was leading at this moment in time. Danny Richardson and, and Camber mentioned that gap. That gap was already too far gone. And there you see the second problem, Greg Eaton. Uh, and this one was a big one as he did indeed oil the tires on the back of that beautiful Mustang as well as the climbing S's, which made it dicey for a few laps. And that's the one that caught out Clark and uh, made him lose time. Then here's where Clark said he just made a mistake, missed his heel and toe, and uh, that happens. Yeah, locked the rear end up on the D on the downshift, but uh, the guy that kept it perfectly clean, Danny Richardson, coming home, uh, what we knew at the time he wasn't sure of, but it became a uh, championship for him. Yeah, is that the last lap? Yeah. Did we get it? Did we get it? And as you said, oftentimes on these special laps of honor, uh, you just pack as many Crew, cool uh, as many crew people into the car as you can to help them celebrate with you. So our first race of this 2023 SCCA National Championship runoffs in the books, Daniel Richardson has become for the first time a national champion. For obviously Thomas alongside here and Hayward Wagner, a huge thank you to all of you who have tuned in for our coverage of American Sedan. Thanks for joining us. Mazda has been very supportive of racers within the SCCA and, and all the other grassroots organizations for many, many years. Really their support for racing and our type of racing is, is unmatched from any other manufacturer. They've been a great partner for many, many years. Mazda, hands down, is the best company to work with for sports car racing. Factory support is uh, second to none. It just feels right. You feel connected.